<laughs> Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Collier with uh, the OpenStack Foundation, and uh, happy to be able to moderate this panel with a bunch of venture capitalists who have been putting millions of dollars into uh, OpenStack companies. But before I grill them on that, uh, let's do some quick introductions. So Simon, do you want to start off? Sure. Well, I'm, I'm not a traditional VC. I was a VC way back, but uh, I run DreamHost. But uh, we have a holding company, a venture firm, that we invest in companies and sort of back things that are close to our own heart. So uh, we uh, put $5 million into Ink Tank to start it back in early 2012. And That's a good call. Good call. Good call. And sold to, uh, to Red Hat in April. And we just um, kicked off another company yesterday, Akanda, in the uh, network virtualization space and are putting one and a half million dollars to work there. I'm also on the OpenStack Foundation Board of Directors. I'm David Lamb. I'm with West Summit. We're a U.S. growth capital investor. Uh, we're the first institutional investor in Morantis. Uh, over the summer, we also uh, invested in Couchbase uh, on the database side. Uh, just a week ago, one of our companies, Maginatics, was acquired by EMC. And uh, we have another company uh, called Maxenta in the storage space, which has some announcements this week as well. Hi there. Uh, I'm Jay Das. I'm one of the MDs with Sapphire Ventures. Uh, we raise most of our money from uh, SAP, the big giant software company. Uh, big investor in open source. Uh, Mirantis is one of our investments. But we were investors in Red Hat. We are investors in MySQL, uh, you know, companies like Cultura and MuleSoft and Jaspersoft, a uh, bunch of companies in that space. Uh, I'm Ryan Floyd, uh, Managing Director at Swarm Ventures. I started the firm about 15 years ago. We just do infrastructure software investing. Been involved with OpenStack, I don't know, two, two three years now. Uh, wrote the first check for MetaCloud. Some people may have heard of that company. Uh, and an investor in uh, SwiftStack. And uh, I'm about to write another check in a company that has yet to be uh, announced. So pretty, pretty active in the community. Cool. And MetaCloud, recently acquired by Cisco. So congrats on that. So uh, one of the reasons I love to moderate panels is just to surprise the, uh, the guests. They all were expecting to be prepared for these questions, but I thought, well, that's not going to be any fun. So the first thing I want to do is just tell you guys a little secret, which is OpenStack is actually free. So uh, how the heck are you all going to make money on this, investing in companies built on software that's, that's free? Anybody? OpenStack's also pretty damn complex, right? So I think that's part of the answer. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, in the, in the case of MetaCloud, uh, that's, that's exactly what they did. They, I mean, that was the hard part for a lot of their customers was deploying. And so uh, they set it up as a service, and that was the model that worked. And they were able to gain uh, a lot of customers that way. But it certainly wasn't selling software. Look, open source software has been around for a long time now, right? Red Hat already showed the way of being a public company. So there's various business models out there. You can have a you know, common core kind of business model where you have an open source core and then you have additional stuff that's built around it. Or you can go kind of like the JBoss or, you know, model where you basically have support and training around it and provide services around it. So yeah, lots and lots of people have made, made money. And, you know, if you look at the Hadoop guys, there are like four of them, like making mm -hmm. tons and tons of money, right? And, cr and then, of course, Mongo and all of that. So, you know, there's lots of models where open source companies have made mo uh, money and, you know, and, and investors have done really well. So there's no reason why open stack companies can't do that. I, I just also add that I think uh, one of the areas that we invest in is, uh, is is in China, and we try to connect a lot of a lot of our U.S. companies with the China market. Um, we we see in, in in China, as I would imagine, in other uh, in, in other regions of the world, a, a huge uh, demand for for open source software as an alternative to some of the incumbent vendors. So I think that uh, going forward, especially with the quantization of hardware and a lot of the great developments in the industry over the last few years, I think open source has a very, very bright future, not only OpenStack, but also a lot of the other ones that we've talked about today. So is anybody here in the audience um, working on a startup, looking to raise money? Show of hands. OK. And probably the others just don't want to raise their hand next to their boss. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so what, what would you want to hear from some of these folks that might pique your interest if they're obviously related to open, OpenStack in, in some way? But you know, what are some of the things that you look for 
uh, right off the bat in that first meeting, that hallway meeting, you know, what do they say to you that makes you think, I'm going to set a meeting on my calendar? Because you guys' calendars must be ridiculously booked and a lot of contention. So what, what, are, what, what is that first uh, intro that gets your attention? First thing is, you know, how many people have downloaded and using it, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of the number one thing uh, because, you know, that's the basis of where all these software companies or, you know, anything in open source kind of goes about, right? So, so you know, how many downloads, who's using it, you know, what kind of, you know, the uh, people, you know, are there, how many committers are there in the, in, the, in the source code? Like, is there, you know, just two committers or, you know, is there like, you know, a bunch of people? What are they doing? So all of that stuff, you know, partners building things around it, mm -hmm. you know, so it doesn't have to be that they're monetizing on the revenue side, but it's just the size of kind of, you know, usage is, is very important. And I think, you know, we're all aware that the, the cost to get something out the door, minimum viable product, whatever you want to call it, you know, has plummeted to, to almost nothing with cloud being one of the main drivers of that. So building, building a product, you really have no excuse. You don't need a ton of money, right? So getting some traction, showing some numbers. If you, if you can't get to that point, that you're probably not going to get past you in the hallway except for, you know, at a high rate of speed. So. Well, th there are business models where people will get proprietary things done and then open source it to build a community around mm -hmm. it. I think, you know, like look at Docker, that's a very good example, right? Where they were a closed kind of thing and then they opened it up mm -hmm. and they have got lots of traction, but that's not always that as successful. Okay. I would say as well that, uh, you know, back to the original point sort of related, which is I think major corporations have now fully realized that open source is just another way of, you know, utilizing software that, that otherwise would be proprietary. And so I think this whole distinction between, um, you know, paying a license fee for proprietary software versus paying something else for delivering the equivalent value, but you're not buying software from a single company with their limited set of developers. You're actually, you know, utilizing software from a large number of developers. OpenStack in the last release had 1,400 developers contributing to that release. So I think I think it's a bit of a mind shift where now there's this realization that you can get quality software, you know, beyond Linux, beyond some of the early um, open source projects. And so having people who understand open source, they, you know, in the company who really understand how to motivate the community, how to, you know, get involved in the whole ecosystem and are very comfortable in that sort of co-opetition type environment. That's that's really one of the crucial aspects as well, mm -hmm. uh, because proprietary tends to be very defensive, protective, and so on. Whereas you know, open source engineers, executives, and so on understand that this is a very tightly knit co-opetition type environment, and they've got to be able to operate in that environment. So that's a key criteria. So so Ryan and um, Simon, you guys both have invested in storage specific with SwiftStack and, and Ink Tanks. So is there anything unique about storage that people need to think about when they're building a business or looking to raise raise funding, or is it just another technology company and you're just looking for traction? Yeah, I, actually, I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a great example. So storage, um, while there's, there's a lot of different open source projects, I think if, you, if, if one doesn't have storage chops, if they can't go in, f in front of a storage administrator and really talk about sort of what's required in a storage world and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone that knows EMC really well, for example, uh, that's going to be a challenge uh, because people that are buying con storage and consuming storage, uh, they're not so concerned about is it a great open source project or not. They're worried about losing data. Uh, and so that, that's a great example where you got to have a, like a mul mul multifaceted in terms of what your skill set is. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of diligence around the, the technical chops. Yeah. And for us with Ink Tank, uh, Sage Weil, the co-founder of DreamHost, had um, created Ceph back you see Santa Cruz sort of back in 06, 05, 06. And uh, so it was a project that had been going for a while. Um, when we decided to look at, you know, really getting behind it commercially separately, um, it had big red warning signs, do not use this in production, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But uh, I think for us, definitely having something like storage shops, but for us it was like, look, Storage is a massive market, you know, $60 billion market. And we, we really felt that a lot of storage companies were just caught napping 
where they didn't realize that every other part of the data center you know, was going virtualized, was going software defined. And so we just felt that, look, we don't know if this is going to work, but we feel like you know, there are a lot of market forces that are moving in that direction. So that's another factor as well is you know, just making sure that what you're doing, particularly in open source, is not too niche. You know? Because if it's, if it's narrow, you just increase your risk that you know, someone else is going to come in from the side and uh, build out your, you know, your special capabilities as well. I just add one more thought uh, in terms of the storage market. Uh, as Simon said, it, it's a huge market. I think that um, having worked in that industry and also made a few investments in the space, there, there, there are going to be certain niches that, that, that you need to get started with, but I think that what's really important is to have a broad enough offering so that you can, um, you know, you think of the $60 billion market, it's, it's probably more like a hundred, eight hundred million dollar markets, and so the goal is to try to pick a handful of those that work well for you, uh, where the the tier of storage you're coming in on is is on the lower tier, ideally, uh, so you can uh, go into production without taking down the entire organization if something falls over, and um, and 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 just making sure that you are articulating and uh, the. The, the right strategy also in, in, in terms of partnering with, with other companies in the ecosystem. Um, you know, one of the great developments over the last 10 years since the, da the, 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 sorry, the decline of the data center and the rise of, of um, uh, virtualized environments is the idea of building a software-based storage company. That just really didn't exist 10 years ago, and you have that opportunity now. Um, with it comes some challenges because you, you have to work with some other, some other parties and it is an ecosystem play. So you're really trying to balance the, the limitations of, of a software-only solution and the ecosystem requirements and dependencies on it in addition to the, the target markets that you're going after. I think those are all uh, key considerations when we look at companies in the space. So it sounds like a lot of it comes down to, uh, as Simon said, some people were caught napping. There's some fat cat companies out there that maybe have some very big margins and they're kind of coasting on that and maybe with, with some lock-in that, that's, that's served them well. So is that uh, the other end of the equation in terms of how you analyze the market itself and see, well, these are a handful of companies that are making you know, pretty massive margins that haven't really embraced some of the software-defined uh, future? Is that, is that part of how you look, look at opportunities as well? Look, I, I, when you look at a company, you don't look at it just if they're open source or not, right? That we have investments in storage companies that are proprietary companies, right? So y you got to kind of, uh, I, I think you have to look at the business model about, you know, how much money is it going to take for them to get to market, you know, uh, get to the customers and things like that. So there are, there are uh, proprietary software companies, you know, both in the infrastructure as well as kind of the application space that do very well being proprietary software companies, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, I, you know, there is no kind of single answer about, okay, it has to be open source to get to market. It all depends on, you know, can you use a community to drive to customers and get to some kind of revenue <coughs> versus, hey, I have to do all this marketing and sales on my own mm -hmm. and get, you know, break down the doors and compete against some of these heavyweights. Uh, and you know how much capital is that going to take, right? So it sounds like it's it's just as much about the community of users and that kind of viral spread of the technology, if you will, uh, for lack of a better phrase, than than whether you know the licensing model of the software. It's it's more about changing the way you know enterprise sales is done. Exactly. Uh, is a big, exactly. A big exactly. Disruption going exactly. on. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, just to, to tack on to that, I mean, I think there are definitely some buyers that don't want any vendor lock-in and love open source because of that. But I think the real value uh, of open source is that community and being able to, you know, the, it's extensible and, you know, multiple parties can sort of like, you know, plug into it. And, and what customers really want, or these enterprises really want, especially if they're buying something like storage, is they want a solution. They don't want a bag of parts. They don't have to stitch a bunch of stuff together. Uh, they, you know, they don't want all that work. They've got 50 problems that they got to deal with, or 100, and they don't want another one. Uh, so it's important to like deliver something that's actually a solution they care about. And that's why these, you know, if you ever wonder why, why are all these proprietary software companies so successful? Well, the answer is because they, they deliver these companies a solution and, and they make it really easy. So if there's one piece of advice to anybody focusing on an open stack, I think this next phase we're embarking on is making it easy to consume mm -hmm. in a whole bunch of different dimensions. And that may be building software on top of some of the open source code that makes it easier, or maybe a delivery method. 
that's gonna be the key. Because if we can make it easier to consume, that's how you're gonna beat EMC or VMware or AWS uh, in, in these enterprise accounts. Because you know, someone's running ops, I mean, they care about open source, but, but not really. What they care about is getting their job done. They care about getting their, their, their application deployed. And that's really what's critical. So you're saying they got 99 problems, but a bag of parts ain't one. I was, I was gonna go there and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, take the, I'll take the hit on that. Um. But, but there, is, there, there is one thing that what we have found with enterprise buyers, as soon as you say you're an open source company, they basically say that your price has to be free or tenth of what they pay for, an, for okay. an enterprise, you know, proprietary. Positioning makes a big yeah, difference. Yeah, so, so that's the double-edged sword, that you mm -hmm. have a community that is driving you and adopting you, but then, you know, maybe the developer or the DevOps teams kind of has done that, and now you want to cut a big deal with the CIO or either the VP or somewhere there, and they're like, oh, it's open source, it should be free, or it should be a tenth of what I'm paying to, you know, VMware or EMC or Oracle or SAP. Right, so that is a that is a double-edged sword you yeah. always get. Like, are any of you guys in Mongo? No, no, we're no. in Couch, but so, not Mongo. So, but yeah, maybe Couch is a good example. But you know, take you know Couch or Mongo. I mean, these are these are enormous database companies in terms of cons you know in terms of actual usage, right? Uh, they should be you know Oracle size. I mean, I mean they, they, these companies should have massive revenues. Yeah. But just to make you know Jay's point, they're not because they can't command the same pricing. I think one of the big things, though, and you just only have to look at it here, is that um, it's like we're in 1999 in, in the world of Linux, right? Right now, today, with OpenStack, that, that, you know, having been a part of the OpenStack movement for, you know, since about six months after it really got formally started, this is a juggernaut that is going to change IT in dramatic ways. And I think the thing that's a little bit different about what happened with Linux is that, you know, even though, of course, you had different Linux distributions and so on and different beneficiaries of Linux, it was the big companies that really benefited probably the most in terms of adoption and usage mm -hmm. of, of Linux. Whereas I think, I hope and I think that OpenStack is different in that, um, OpenStack distributed systems is frankly a lot more complex from a software perspective than it than you know than an operating system. Um, uh, don't tell you know don't tell Linus that I said that. But um, but it is distributed systems is very complex. You're managing it's a data you know, center operating. It's system. It's a data yeah, center yeah, operating yeah, system, not a not a server operating system. And so I think that there is. The key thing is, is my belief is there are massive opportunities because there's this huge wave of, wave of transformation and change coming. Just in the last few years, looking at the OpenStack Summit and the companies that are participating in OpenStack and betting on OpenStack, the momentum is there. So, so I think it's going to be interesting and different. Uh, as Ryan said, there's plenty of opportunity to have companies that serve a particular need. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, as that open source software player in the stack. Um, you know, we've just launched Akanda, which is in the networking, network virtualization, but, um, but services around OpenStack, I mean, there's, there's a huge amount of opportunity for, for these kind of ventures. I will be contrarian, though. Mm -hmm. I will say the big juggernaut is AWS. It's not really, OpenStack is really playing catch up. Um, it has been uh, basically a reaction against AWS. Uh, if you look at, you know, talk to a lot of CIOs, many of the CIOs in the audience here, you know, they're worried that their jobs will be gone because, you know, all the developers, they're going to AWS to put everything up. Uh, you know, all their development is out there either in AWS and now increasingly on Google Cloud. So, so really, the, the, you know, OpenStack is playing kind of catch up and allowing C CIOs to do the private, uh, you know, deploy private clouds in just an easier, easy way as, as, you know, AWS does for developers. So I think the challenge and where you can build big companies is if you look at why people go to AWS is because they have all the services that you need to write a program. You want a CDN, it's out there. You want an email delivery, it's out there. You want a Hadoop cluster, it's out there. You want a database, inline memory database, it's out there, right, in AWS. So I think uh, OpenStack doesn't have that. You kind of get the, you know, we have heard this complaint, like, oh, I've got OpenStack set up, now what do I do? I, I know I still have to get somebody to put Hadoop on top of it. I still have somebody to get, you know, kind of some kind of. We, email. we did add Hadoop and Juno, just so you know. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know, but, but, but it's a totally fair point. It's, yeah. it's getting there, right? But the yeah. thing is that it's AWS, ha, we are playing catch up. OpenStack is That's playing fair. catch up. AWS has all of these services out there, and I think that is where all the 
uh, you know, opportunities are for building companies along with orchestration and all these services on top of open source. I think AWS is like Microsoft in the early days. They had the lead, uh, but they didn't have the ecosystem, right? I mean, they had a certain ecosystem. So I think AWS absolutely, AWS is not going to be the winner here. OpenStack is going to be the winner. AWS is the catalyst. But, uh, I mean, you look at the, ar the array of companies that are now arrayed against o AWS. I mean, in terms of market cap, in terms of resources and so on, I think, you know, I think it's going to be, yeah. Well, and, I mean, just, uh, just, just on that, uh, on the AWS thing, you know, I've been following this for, uh, you know, a very long time as a venture investor. And it, what, what built my initial conviction a couple years ago around OpenStack wasn't that it was open source you know, shock, right? It wasn't because it was a community, shock. I mean, because my LPs don't care about that. What they care about is making money. They care about building businesses. And what gave me conviction, actually, was that when you looked at all these companies that were in AWS and the money that they were spending at some very, you know, reasonable number, a couple hundred thousand dollars a month, it starts to make sense to pull that in-house in if you can make it easy to consume. And so I think AWS had this, had this massive early start. But if you look at big SaaS companies, None of them run in AWS, and they won't, because it just doesn't make any sense from an economic standpoint. So I think as OpenStack gets better and better and easier and easier to consume, it's it's inevitable you're going to see this arc, you know, towards uh, towards private clouds. It doesn't mean that AWS goes away, because as test and dev, it's awesome. Right. It's great. Right. So it'll have you know, and if you're st for lots of our little startups that are just getting started that don't want to set up an Equinox and you know a, a roll up, a roll out an OpenStack service, it's great because it's easy. Swipe their credit card, they're off they're off to go. But then as they get big and they start spending a couple hundred thousand dollars a month, then the question emerges, what do we do, right? And there's, there's, you know, some people point to companies like Pinterest or Dropbox, these companies that are still in AWS, but they're the exceptions. The only reason they're still there is because they don't care because they're growing so fast, they have so much money that it's not one of their top problems to move out, but yeah. they all will. Groupon did, they all will. Dropbox is starting to move out now, Box is trying to move out of their, their backup service, so it's, it's, it's inevitable. Yeah, and we, we heard from Tapjoy this morning. If you guys yes, were in the in, in the the keynotes this morning, you know they they have 450 million users a month. I mean that's that's some serious scale, and uh, you know they're they're op they're operating worldwide, and they've just moved a huge amount of their um, infrastructure onto Amazon, or excuse me, onto OpenStack from Amazon. And I think what's interesting is they they built it right next to Amazon, right? They put it in Equinix with a fast connect to AWS. I think that that is going to become more and more popular. And then if it's cheaper, and sometimes it can be dramatically cheaper to run you know, the base workloads in your OpenStack private cloud, I mean, people you get hung up on this public-private. At the end of the day, it's, it's an engine for you to automate your IT. And if, if it gets easier, as you've said, through things like MetaCloud, I think they're a MetaCloud customer, um, you know, through those, uh, those ecosystem companies in the OpenStack ecosystem, then it becomes really kind of a, an easier and easier decision be built and there's a lot of company that will be built to provide all of that stuff yes. and that's why we are all here looking for opportunity then people start willing to start companies have to think about hey how can I make you know OpenStack as easy to use as AWS well and and, and, and allowing companies to shift over earlier than a Groupon or or a, or a Pinterest could um, but but really making it easier and easier then 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 you really are putting AWS in a transitional technology state which mm -hmm. which is I think everybody's goal here absolutely and uh, so I'm not personally raising money at the moment so <laughs> I thought I'd open it up to questions you know I can hit you guys up later but um, d are there any questions I notice we have a lot of mics so maybe there are some people that want to step up to them yes sir the talk has been around enterprise market. Uh, what's your l appetite for investing in something that's targeted towards service providers? Earlier this morning, we, we heard about Orange uh, and a couple of AT&T, et cetera, talk about their use of OpenStack and in NFT environments. Uh, that's question one, and uh, I have a second question around networking, but I'll, I can wait till the first question. Well, question one, so Akanda that we just launched is absolutely oriented towards service providers. So, I mean, look, you know, the picks and shovels approach to uh, OpenStack investing, I think, is great. Um, you know, big companies will be big consumers of code that help them orchestrate, manage, and, uh, you know, establish the services using OpenStack. So, I think it's, 
In fact, it's in many ways, that, that can be a less risky approach than, you know, from an investing perspective than, you know, trying to go out and get true end users um, for your, you know, your software or your service. I, I would say that, you know, we've, we funded some companies actually even over the summer that are focused on, on service, the service provider market, uh, not, not in this specific sector, but in, but in a different sector. Uh, so, so we do like that, that target market. That being said, uh, the sales cycles are typically quite long, and um, there are uh, uh, issues as well sometimes with, with payables and, and, and actually getting paid for the <laughs> work that you do. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but, but they, these are also, you know, he, as Simon said, huge customers. So, um, so I think it's, it's an area that we would look at, but we would probably, as an investor, really try to understand the sales cycle, understand the pain points, um, uh, because it is, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a longer bet in terms of uh, seeing the, the results on the, from the business model. Yes, so I can I tell you from personal experience, some of the larger companies can take a little while to pay yeah. their bills. It's yeah, <laughs> that's I off would, of their uh, list. Uh, Mark, I would so just... That's a fair warning. I, I would say stay away from service providers, <laughs> if you can. Uh, they can build a big business out there. People have done that, but uh, it's long sales cycle. You're probably, if you have something, better off trying to sell to the enterprise data centers and, you know, and from there move, move all the way up. But uh, yeah, it, it is, and, and you know, the other challenge you have is the uh, incumbents have much more stronger hold on service providers than they have in the enterprise side. Park the microphone for a second. Uh, the second question is about uh, SDN. You know, we, we talked about a few network virtualization examples, including looks like Akanda is in that space, but what about the generic SDN market, especially with ODL now coming to light? You know, is there any appetite for uh, investing in more broader SDN-based startups? Do you see any activity there? Thank you. So I think uh, as from a, you know, just very selfish venture standpoint, you know, SDN's been a pretty big disappointment. Uh, notwithstanding NYSERA, <laughs> which was a huge exit, uh, I like to think that is the first billion dollar OpenStack exit. It, well, well, it was. Uh, it was with less than five million in revenue to one, really to one customer. Uh, so, so I wouldn't look at that as an example of let's go try and go build that and repeat it because it's just it's hard. Uh, if you look at the companies like Big Switch, Plum Grid, uh, you know the ones that are out there. I mean, it. You know, they're doing. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're they're doing they're doing okay. But they've had they've they've struggled I think in the enterprise and the and the reason is because mo my, my opinion just just my opinion most enterprises can solve their uh, networking problems uh, with VLANs they they can make it work they can make it work with existing equipment today and SDN adds a lot of complexity to the equation and already what you've heard us say up here is a pretty complex environment to begin with so I think where SDN's very powerful is in the service provider world. Uh, but for some of the reasons you just heard us talk about, that's got its own tricks and issues in terms of you know really dealing with that. So I think it's got potential, but I think the way I sort of think about it is it's going to be kind of the next wave. We've got to have some large private clouds deployed before SDN is going to be a big market in terms of actual dollar spend. Not to say there may not be some other big exits, um, but in terms of you know do dollar spend. I think it's also been been difficult for people to kick the tires on an SDN environment where, you know, the handful of early um, options were all proprietary, right? And so it's not to say that it couldn't solve a problem so great that you would wouldn't you know want to write a check for it, but just you know, open source again, building a community means people can instantly try it. They can run it on ten servers. They can run it on fifty servers. They haven't really made a commitment to a to a vendor or anything. They can just play around with it and see wh how, how it works. And it's a little bit different when you're in a, a market where you have a proprietary is, are sort of like the only options. And there are some that are starting to come along, you know, like uh, uh, you know, Open Contrail and there's a number of others that I'm suddenly forgetting. But yeah, Cumulus and... Yeah, I think, I mean, maybe it's just because I'm an operator, probably more than an investor, that I don't really think about the exit too much. Um, I mean, look, if you're in B2C investing, do you think they're worried about revenue day one? No, they're not. They're worried about adoption and so on. And I think even in this space, I mean, it, if you believe in OpenStack and you believe in, in you know, where this is going and the transformation of IT that's happening, 
two years ago with Ink Tank, we really struggled to get anyone to look at it for exactly the same reasons. People were like, no, it's too hard. You've got these big incumbents, you know, service providers won't adopt. Enterprise, you know, doesn't like the fact that this is perceived as reasonably reliable and so on. But, you know, look where we are today with Swift Stack doing great and Ink Tank doing great and that sort of thing. So I think to some extent, you know, if you're an investor, you take risk. Um, you know, you're not looking to have uh, risk with 100% guarantee that it's going to work. So I think, uh, I think SDN is, is a great market. I think it is the last sort of big frontier in terms of truly software defined. And uh, so I think, I think there's going to be a lot of investments in that space that pay off very, very well. And, and you know, not just in dollar terms, but in terms of satisfaction that you're really transforming a market that you know has incredible lock-in and incredible margins, you know, with the traditional vendors. And so. there's an old saying that you know that being too early is indistinguishable from from being wrong. So, you know, there may be some of that at play here, which right. is you know, timing is everything. So, do you want to counter his his point? You think he kind of gave give a different view? No. The only thing I would say is that networking is one of those things where people take don't take lightly, right? So. It's always like storage or whatever. You can put something else on the side. You know, you can use test and dev or whatever. But you know, networking, if it doesn't good work, point. it doesn't work. It's a very right? good point. You can't put test and dev on networking that's the uh, infrastructure that is new, and it doesn't work. You won't be able to do anything. So I, I think that's why it's partly the reason that people are really uh, against you know testing kind of you know these new new companies mm -hmm. because they're really worried that hey, if this goes down, my none of my people can do any work, right? But so it is, it, it is, it's a much higher bar than storage or any other infrastructure software that's out there. So but that's, where I, that's where I just disagree, right? Um, virtualized networking is the point. Virtualized networking is automated, it's algorithmic. I mean, it's exactly the same as storage. Storage, distributed storage is all about distributing your data across many nodes across failure zones in the data center and so on. And networking, in my opinion, is exactly the same. It's in, in you know, we, with Akanda, we have intelligent, distributed, virtualized routing. And the whole system is designed so that it works. And if any one virtual router fails for any reason, or if that server node is down, there are plenty of other virtualized routers in the design of the system to, to pick up the workload. So. I think uh, I think in and of its nature, software-defined virtualized networking, you know, will have that built in. Well, so on this this point about networking, um, that definitely brings up the specter of security, which is you know one of the re another reason people are reluctant to mess with the network, which hasn't really fundamentally changed in many many years, and you know, Cisco's done done pretty well for. For continuing to sell sell you what you had what you had with a few new bells and whistles and jun Juniper and a few others, but you know what about security? Are you guys looking at anything related to OpenStack and cloud in the security space? We are looking at security. I haven't heard of anything open source security companies. I um it doesn't have to be open source either. Just you know, cloud computing and security. There's got to be some opportunity there. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's probably a good time to start thinking about security, specifically around OpenStack. You know, Keystone's great, but it's not comprehensive. And I, and I, and I think security is a great example where the OpenStack community is not going to deliver a very good solution. And the reason is because most people uh, don't really care about a high degree of security because security it's not free. It comes with it's a tax. And so I think it's a great area where probably we're going to see the really interesting innovation. The, the base layer will be there within OpenStack, but we'll probably see some private companies deliver OpenStack security solutions uh, that will probably be the best, just simply because it's not going to be broadly applicable to everybody that's dealing with OpenStack. I mean, if you're deploying an OpenStack test in DevCloud, you really don't care about like, you know, some compliance security that you convince you know, your, your banking customers uh, that, uh, that you're compliant with. It's just not relevant. So it's not going to be part of the core. Um, but what, what was required, I think, to Mark's point about, you know, time kills uh, investments, if you made a security investment two years ago at OpenStack, you'd be out of business because it just wasn't relevant. But I think it's relevant today. So I think it's, it's, it's a good time. But, but yeah, we, at, our, at our CEO summit, we had like five CIOs, and they all said 
that security was like basically an area where they could spend unlimited, right? If you had a budget, you know, they basically their budget. Music to your ears, I assume? Uh, <laughs> no, but it's music <laughs> to ears people starting companies, right? Yes. Because, uh, you know, it's hard right now with like, you know, a lot of the big data stuff, analytics and things like that. And there's so much stuff going on. You can actually build security companies uh, that are very different than what people were doing previously. And it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be a big appliance, it can be all software. And so arguably security has actually been the biggest exit in the OpenStack ecosystem, which was Nasira. Because one of the big value propositions of Nasira was the tenant isolation mm -hmm. that their layer two technology offered. In fact, that was really the value proposition. Was, you know, yes, you can be running these virtualized compute instances in the cloud, but you're gonna have tenant isolation. So to some That's degree, I think point, yeah. you know, security, security is very important in that way. And I do think open source actually has a bit of a black eye with security and that needs to be addressed. You know, the last two big vulnerabilities, OpenSSL and, and then the Bash vulnerability, um, just in the last eight months have actually given open source a bit of a black eye because open source is supposed to be code that, you know, is scrutinized by many people and so vulnerabilities will, will show up really quickly or will be identified quickly. But in both those cases, they were sleeper vulnerabilities that were around for, you know, in one case, two years, in another case, more than that. 20 years, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so uh, now that might be an opportunity. Yeah. Any more questions from the audience? So the, the, so the question was about valuations and exit values and, and how that might compare or contrast versus uh, open source versus proprietary? Well, I, I mean, uh, it's, it's not a very exciting exciting answer, but I, I mean, I think it, it basically matches up more or less with what you'd find in the proprietary world. And to some extent, it's even it could be even higher. So if you just look at, you know, look at the Hadoop companies, right, as examples in terms of revenue, multi-billion dollar valuations. Elasticsearch was like 600, something like that. Uh, 700, uh, Elasticsearch, right, with Lucene and Solar. Um, uh, you know, Docker uh, was done at uh, what four four hundred something like that by Sequoia. Uh, no, no revenue. Uh, so, so uh, you definitely see you know lofty valuations. I think it's I think what drive the drivers are different. The drivers in open source is what Jay was saying earlier, which is community adoption. You know, pace of adoption, all these things where people like to draw you know lines, connect you know A to B, and the steeper the graph, the bigger the valuation kind of thing. Um, whereas in proprietary uh, software companies, you're going to see that growth being driven more by customer adoption, you know, revenue, some more basic metrics. But I think the valuations are there, and I think the exits are there. Um, so you know, the jury's still out, I guess, on some of these really high-priced, you know, Hadoop companies. What happens with them? But it's likely they go public. I mean, I, I don't. I mean, they have the revenue today. It seems in the revenue growth, you, know, you could likely see uh, Cloudera or Hortonworks go public next year. Um, we sold Jaspersoft to Tipco, right? Um, you can be open source, but proprietary software companies still have issues with open source. I think VMware has done a good job buying uh, several open source companies, but a lot of the proprietary software companies, their legal departments still have an issue with it, and they will kind of go through how much IP you have, you know, what is open source, what is not. So, so you know, as you build a company, you kind of have to make sure that you kind of, you know, in your code, making, you know, what is getting diluted by you know that, that you know they're opening up versus what what is proprietary? So yeah, so it's not like a slam dunk uh, that a proprietary software company will just buy open source companies. Yeah, so we we did this summer we we did a f uh, we led Couch we did a, a funding round for for Nexenta, one of our companies that has an open source heritage. We sold Maginatics, which is not open source uh, TMC, and I would say from valuation exit standpoint they're 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 pretty much you know similar metrics um you know f category specific um and 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 i do think that on the proprietary side one benefit you have is that when the company does exit you have um you have to go through all the scrutiny but but the ip is is yours there's no um what's open source and what's not mm -hmm. so i do think that you know in in those instances it, it it's um you know it, it does it does help um but Again, if you're if you if both you know two companies, one has an open source uh, um, you know, s background, one doesn't, 
Um, and, you know, and, and more or less the technology is doing the same thing. You know, y if, if you have the community behind it, I think you'd probably give the edge to the open source side, but probably not by a whole lot. And a couple of quick tactical things. Um, in the case of Akanda and Ceph, uh, the trademark was incredibly important. So making sure that you have, you know, secured your trademark early, not only in the US, but internationally, ideally, um, in key international markets. You know, making sure that you've protected your trademark, so get your lawyer to put, you know, be on the alert list so that if other trademarks show up elsewhere in the world that are, you know, confusingly similar, that you, you know, you send letters and you address that so that you, you know, you're shown to have owned that trademark. And then the other thing is copyright as well. If you've got team members, just make sure you've got a really strong IP assignment agreement because even though it is open source software, the copyright in the open source software you know, it is an important sort of measure of value, at least in terms of your team's contributions to that software. Obviously, other contributors won't have copyright, they'll have their own copyright in the software um, outside of your company, but that was another important factor to have certainty around. So I had a question about uh, these exits. You guys have, have all, you know, wouldn't be here if you hadn't sold some of the companies you invested in. So. Um, does it matter to you, you know, what company buys one of your investments, or is it really just who writes the biggest check? I don't think it doesn't and by the way, I'm a, I'm a capitalist, so yeah. it's fine with it, me if you it, say it, the biggest <laughs> check. It, 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 it doesn't matter to me, uh, but it usually matters to the teams. And, and ultimately, uh, I was just telling everybody, people think venture investors sell companies. We don't sell anything. I mean, honestly, I mean, we, we don't get to make any decisions. Uh, it's like being parents of your kids. You think you're in control, you're really not. <laughs> uh, so we don't get to make that decision. It's really up to the team. Because if the team, you know, if Meta, just use a recent example, if MetaCloud came to me and said, you know what, we really don't want to partner with Cisco. We don't, we don't want to work with Cisco. What am I going to say? Shut up, get back to work, go, go to work for Cisco? <laughs> uh, it's not, it's not going to work. Uh, so really, it's the teams that end up making the decisions. So those cultures have to match. And I think acquirers test that very early on. I would suspect the same thing was true with Ink Tank. You know, Red Hat probably tested the culture very early on with Ink Tank and whether or not it'd be a good fit. And if they didn't think it was going to be a good fit, my guess is they wouldn't have gone through with the acquisition. So uh, it does matter ultimately uh, to, the te to the teams, to the acquirers. Probably matters less to us, uh, but somewhat indirectly. I, I would just add that in the open source space, it, it, and well, I, I'd say in the proprietary software as well. Um, I think the ha having the CEOs buy in is, is critical. Um, you know, when you know, a lot of the time, a lot of times, a lot of the key engineers, if not all of them, you know, will will be reviewed on a on a person by person basis by the uh, by the acquirers, so they really want to make sure that you know who they're who's coming on board. You know, typical terms include some, uh, you know, some some lockup or or kind of s uh, that requires certain people to stay uh, for an extended period of time. So there's, you know, th these are these are uh, strategic acquisitions, and and I think that they want to make sure that that the value is captured. So that goes both ways, that the the company actually wants to join up. Uh, we had one company in a different sector uh, in the internet space called Twitch which is a live game streaming platform. They sold to Amazon over the summer. And, and, and they actually took a, a lower offer from them uh, relative to some others based on the ability to stay independent, uh, et cetera. So uh, no comment. So, so that's, so Sorry, that, that's also important. <laughs> <laughs> you all know what yeah, culture is really important. Um, it's tricky because I think when you're a startup, you, you know, you want to appeal to the broadest possible audience of potential you know, partners and ultimately maybe acquirers and that sort of thing. But I think uh, my own personal opinion is that you're actually better to start out and, and make sure that you have a really strong culture and sort of a strong early view of, of, of the companies that really fit your culture and fit your vision for the way the world is going to work um, and those that don't. doesn't mean that you don't work with the companies that don't exactly fit, but I think you know, in the case of Ink Tank, we, we had a really strong opinion of who we were as a company and what we represented, and that actually helped a lot. Um, it narrowed the field of, of companies that would invest and so on, but I think also ultimately, you know, when it came down to getting a call from Red Hat, um, 
you know, it, they, they knew exactly who we were. And, uh, and it wasn't just from interaction, it was just sort of we exuded that kind of culture. So it is tricky as an investor, I'm sure, you know, having that, it's a bit of a dichotomy, you know. So I'm interested in, you know, what you all hope to get out of your time here in Paris besides amazing food and wine. I mean, are you hoping to meet some new entrepreneurs? Are you catching up with the, the ones that you already invested in? Are you just trying to see if what the traction really looks like? I mean, what, what, what brought you here besides this wonderful panel? I just wanted to see what everybody is doing, right? Not only entrepreneurs, but also the big companies, right? Mm -hmm. EMC is here, you know, Red Hat is here, you know, Aristo, everybody is here. And, uh, you know, first of all, I was amazed by how many attendees uh, there are in the summit, right? I heard over 3,000, which is, and I think it's probably more than that. So yeah, we actually had uh, 4,700. So that, that's an awesome number. The biggest right? summit ever. And, yeah. uh, you know, and what's interesting, sorry to interrupt, no, no, but no, if no. you look at, you know, VMworld, which in is there traditionally is in, you know, uh, Moscone Center, huge, and they bring it to Europe, has about 5,000 people. So, you know, when you think about putting on an event in Europe, it's, it's at that scale now, um, and it's a distributed uh, And I also effort. wanted to see what people are doing in various, you know, in networking, in security, you know, in orchestration, everything, right? So, was Yeah, for, for us, for myself and, and my firm, it's, it's all the above. Um, I, I think the comment was made earlier today uh, in this panel about how AWS is really the, you know, the, the lion sitting in the, you know, uh, on the planes waiting for, for, for this movement to take shape. I and call it the monolith <laughs> in the room, but that's, uh, we can call it a lion. What, what, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so I think that, uh, to Jay's point, ev w w you know, I'm here to, to really uh, learn more about what's going on in the industry, uh, both from the large companies that are here as well as from the startups and, and the companies in between like, uh, like Morantis. And Accenta, so, um, so so that's that, that's our purpose. But it's been it also has been great to, to see all the you know the community, and you know I think we've you know this is a great great movement, and you know we want to keep seeing progress. So, and I think given the attendees here, we should maybe do do it in Moscone next time, right? And you know we we've talked about it. <laughs> we like those, to do things a little differently, numbers, but we we could certainly uh, fill Moscone, I believe, if we uh, if we went there. I think you know I have one last question. I think we're we're about out of time, but um, I am. Curious. We're talking about you know places, geography. You know how diverse OpenStack is. I mean, what regions are you all looking to to invest in? I mean, where do you see opportunity? Whether it's China or parts of Europe or you know anywhere anywhere in the world that that might be uh, interesting for the crowd to hear about. Well, I think OpenStack is global, right? I mean, you look at the metrics around uh, members of OpenStack. I mean, the U.S. obviously is at the top of the list, but you know, there's there's some very close followers in you know China, India, and so on. So OpenStack's global. So the fact that there's a huge audience here, when we were in Asia last year in Hong Kong, there was a big number as well. It was like four, four and a half thousand attendees. So I think to some degree you've you've almost got to think more globally than that and mm -hmm. not necessarily I think if you if you're thinking regionally, you know, particularly given this platform, you're probably thinking too an small. Maybe an outmoded yeah. way of looking at Yeah, the I mean, uh, the early, you know, some of the just Ink Tank by exa way of example, a lot of our early adopters were in Europe and Asia, actually, outside of the US, um, because often they're the companies that are really trying to do it different. They're trying to get a leg up over the competition and that sort of thing. So, you know, they, they tend to more want to look for alternatives to the, you know, the incumbent. Well, it, we invested in Mirantis with the express purpose of taking them into the China market. And one of the less covered stories w in the in the funding release was the the day after they released a, um, in Chinese a uh, uh, a press release about the opening of the China office, and we've already started to build a pipeline there and, and have customers and partners, et cetera. So, uh, so we think China is a huge has a huge um, uh, is a greenfield for, for for OpenStack, and we really want to support both Mirantis and also the rest of the ecosystem to be successful there. By the way, United Stack, I think we have some folks from there here. They're, they're one of our earliest ecosystem uh, companies in China, so I'll give them a shout out. So we are a global fund, uh, so we invest across geographies, right? So we have investments here in Europe, uh, you know, in Israel, in India, of course, a majority is in the U.S., but I will echo everybody else's thing about open source. That's one of the key things that you see with open source companies is how right from day one their customer base is global. 
because mm -hmm. it's downloadable, because, you know, so you always have this challenge, like, okay, it's a small company, how the hell am I going to open an office in Europe, in Asia, you know, in Latin America, where I'm seeing all these demand, and how do I go about do running my business there? But that is, you know, the benefit of Yeah, there's, I think, something called the World Wide Web, which can really help. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but, but because it's downloadable. Because it's downloadable. One right, click one from click, anywhere. You know, right, because then you have proprietary soft, although now people do this freemium models, but if you have, like, a proprietary kind of appliance selling security or selling storage, you, most of your customers are all going to be in the geography you ten, yeah. which is typically US and then maybe Israel. Friction's a killer you're, these you're days. Exactly. But in open source you always have downloads across the world and then you have to figure out how to monetize those downloads. I mean, just be a little controversial, I guess. I would tell p advice for people in the audience, though. Unless you're planning on just delivering your solution regionally, and I'm actually about to invest in a company that's based in Argentina, it's going to service the Latin American market, that's great. They can be based in in Argentina. Great guys from Mercado Libre, by the way. Right. Uh, yeah, th it's, a great <laughs> it's a great team. Really good team. Uh, but having said that, I will tell you, it's gotten harder and harder to build a big company outside of Silicon Valley. Because what you'll run into very quickly, uh, and I think Simon probably said, even with even with Ink Tank, like you know, Br Brian and Sage were on a plane all the time coming up to Silicon Valley. Right. Uh, MetaCloud, these guys, they had. There's this thing called Surf Air, where you this is like subscription where, uh, airline thing, where you pay a thousand bucks a month and it's unlimited travel. They all had it at MetaCloud, and they were just in Pasadena, uh, getting up to Silicon Valley. So we've seen this huge trend of entrepreneurs, and it's whether it's proprietary or open source. We got a company called Algolia, another one called TalkDesk, a company called PipeDrive. They're all based in Europe, but all the exec the, the executive team has moved to the to the U.S., particularly Silicon Valley. So I tell you, you, you got to think hard about that because I think what you'll find is that a lot of the partners, the executives, people you want to hire, you may not be able to find them in Amsterdam or wherever it is you happen to be located. You don't have to think hard. That's what you got to do. Yeah. It's like you know, every company that we talk to here, we basically say that once you have the product done. You have to move your, you know, CEO and maybe, you know, biz dev team for sure, and your marketing team. But yeah, big chunk of your company has to be in the valley, which is sad, yeah. but that's true. I mean, I wouldn't say. I mean, I wouldn't say quite as hard as Jay does that you have to be there, because <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's uh, there's certainly great examples of great companies outside of the U.S. So uh, they can have, but but I just you know just a cautionary note. I mean, I think that, that doesn't, have <laughs> doesn't have a Silicon Valley uh -oh. office. Well, but I think I the key <laughs> is that you don't need, this is, the, this is just to clarify, we're not saying that you have to have product development in Silicon Valley. Exactly, right? exactly. I mean, the heart of your company, what you're building, yeah. you know, yeah. can be right where you started, can be all your great people. In fact, that's a strategic advantage a lot can of the time. Can be distributed. You're really, well. you're really talking about Silicon Valley is this network hub. It's the ultimate Facebook for entrepreneurs, basically, uh, right? And, and, you and, and you run into people, and um, for those of you who haven't been yeah, here. Yeah, and, so. and you also have, if you're building an enterprise company, you have, you know, high-tech companies who are willing to kind of, you know, take a, to build, try out the latest and greatest kind of technologies for their, you know, internal IT operations, which you will not find anywhere else in the world, right? So, so time check, are we done? Okay. Thank you guys so much. Um, good luck in your hallway pitches to these guys. Thank you. Tell them about your traction.